I cited right there that I would help bring his wonderful talk to a wider audience. Dr. Salty has been a full-time lecturer of Arabic here at Stanford since 1998, and he also has a great blog called Arabology, as well as a weekly radio program with the same name on Stanford's radio, pro um, radio show KZSU, and it's Thursdays 3 to 5. The reason I'm telling you this is I know that after his talk, you will definitely want to tune into that. So without further ado, the wonderful Dr. Salty. <laughs> So, salam, shalom, bonjour, buongiorno, uh, merhaba, Turkish, right? And thank you all for coming to this uh, thing tonight. Um, Julia is, I don't have to tell you, if you don't know Julia, you should. She's the most amazing young lady in the world. And uh, she came up to me, actually, after I had been uh, uh, a guest uh, lecturer for a course on representations of the Jew in Arabic literature and vice versa. And uh, I was invited to kind of show representations of uh, uh, you know, Arabs in Israeli literature and music. And uh, I don't know, I just, I remember we moved classrooms, Julia, right? From yeah. one classroom to another. And uh, on the way I said, what is your name, young lady? And she said, Julia Turan. And next thing I know, I'm being invited to do this thing. <laughs> and I'm very, very happy because music for me has been an integral part of my life. And after teaching at Stanford for over 10 years, I decided, you know, is that it? Like, it's a great job and everything, but, you know, is that what I'm going to do till I retire? Uh, and, then I, and then the radio came my way. And thank God for the radio, KZSU, 90.1 FM is your radio station, 90.1, and we stream also. And they invited me to be on a show, and then I got my own show. And uh, it's called Arabology, it's on Thursdays, 4 to 6. And the idea behind this show is to show how music can bring so many uh, sides together. It seems to me like if you listen to a song and you like it, it doesn't matter if it's in Hebrew, if it's in Arabic, if it's in English, uh, you kind of connect with the melody. And very quickly, I think you learn that a lot of uh, songs, you know, recorded and sung in Hebrew sound very much like Arabic, especially to Americans who speak neither. So I think that that's, uh, I think that that's a really good point to make, is if the music sounds the same, and in Arabic, the word for Arabic is Arabi, and the word for Hebrew is Ebri, so it's really two letters difference. You switch the B and the R and you end up with the same word. That to me is significant. And I have to say also that in my classes here at Stanford where I teach Arabic uh, at different levels, I've always, always felt very proud and uh, um, you know, it filled my heart to know that I had kids who were of all religions and backgrounds sitting together learning Arabic. So I've got you know Jewish students, Muslim students, Christian students, and everything else. And sometimes some of these students uh, don't interact or hadn't interacted before, especially if they're foreign students. Because as you know, one of the sad realities of living in the Middle East is that many countries are not allowed interactions with other countries. So, so you know, Lebanese musicians can't perform in Israel, and Israeli musicians can't perform in Lebanon, let's say. And it's due to the you know, government uh, policies. But once you get beyond that, you, my gosh, like this group I'm going to talk about tonight at the end of the presentation named Mashru Alayla, if you look at their YouTube page, you're going to find people from Israel, from all over the Arab world, sort of all going together like, we're like brothers, we should be singing in unison, you know. So I'm not attempting to simplify a very, you know, complex issue, and nor do I want my talk to be political today. But I wanted to say that through music, we're going to look at representations of the other today. We're going to see how Arabic music not only has evolved, but also how it has tended to represent the other. 
The other could be the Jew, it could be women, it could be dealing with issues that were hushed up uh, a few years ago, and then kind of have this like uh, drum roll moment where afterwards we'll, we'll look at the music that came out of the revolutions going on in the Arab world, what I like to call the, the soundtrack to the Arab Spring. And the Arab Spring, in my opinion, would not have happened if it weren't for music. And I'm going to show you why I'm saying that by looking at some of the amazing music that fueled the revolutions. Um, and one last thing about the revolutions is that I don't believe that they're over. And I don't believe that the current state of affairs in uh, Tunisia or Egypt or Libya or other places is the way it's going to end up. I think it's going to evolve into a much better place. Uh, inshallah. So uh, I'm going to try to do my own uh, technical, uh, because I didn't want Eric over here to have to stand and do this. I'm going to try to, to, to multitask Eric, but if I can't, you're going to have to kind of come help me out. Uh, so, and, and I think this YouTube thing helped me, Mahta, but if we get a commercial, like, I can't control it. Suddenly, like, we're listening to beautiful music, and they're like, get a mail order right. If that happens, Mahta, you like, take their mind away from it, and I'll mute it quickly or something. So I'm going to use strictly YouTube videos. And uh, if I were to play these 30 videos in their entirety, it would be a three-hour lecture. I'm only going to play, uh, like, sometimes 10 seconds from a clip. If you like it, you have a, a sheet here that has the names of the musicians. You can Google them yourself or go to YouTube um, and uh, find out more about them, because there's an amazing array of musicians coming out of the Arab world specifically. So, if we look at uh, Arabic music, the one I grew up with in the 60s and 70s, uh, it was, you know, it was kind of like uh, classical um, pieces. Uh, that sometime, the average song, I remember, you know, from my dad telling me the average length of a song by someone like Um Kulthum, who I'll talk about very briefly in a second, is 60 minutes. <laughs> One song, 60 minutes. So you had, you know, an orchestra that would start and the audience would, you know, clap and suddenly this very grand uh, lady would step on stage, her name is and uh, she would start singing. She had what they called a larynx of gold. The, she could sing for hours and hours and hours. And uh, she comes from Egypt. So she would start singing like one verse, and it would be very difficult Arabic poetry, but very poignant. And then by the time she finished the verse, everybody would just start, oh, you know, clapping and, and shouting, and people were known to faint you know, from one verse. So of course she would have to stop. 911 would be called. And then, and then she would say the verse again. This time you'd get another one. So if each verse she says would be like 10 minutes to deliver, a poem would take an hour, you know, or more. And so she, she's an amazing woman, and I, if you like this kind of Arabic music, the music I grew up with and maybe didn't appreciate as a kid, because it sounded to me like it was all like, ah, now uh, it's the kind of music that saves my life when I'm depressed or I need a perk. So Um Kulthum, who apparently is said is a direct descendant of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, uh, is, is amazing not only in the fact that she made she made it on her own as a woman in uh, Egypt and in the Arab world, but also because you know in her private life she never really married. There's a slight exception there, but I won't go there. But it was like she she was a single woman who had more power and influence over the Arab world in terms of politics through her music than some of the presidents themselves. Uh, so she has a fascinating life, and uh, I'm going to, to show you a clip from um, uh, uh, one of her most famous songs called uh, Al Atlal. And uh, from Al Atlal, which means the ruins, you're going to kind of get an idea what her singing is like. 
if you get bored and you're like, what is this? Why did I come here to listen to this lady go on? <laughs> you probably just need to be seasoned a bit, but it's gonna get like like better. <laughs> All right. So we'll begin with her singing al atlal, and I found a version that had the English subtitles so that you can um, actually know what she's moaning and groaning about. <laughs> Egyptian cinema, and if you saw the way the woman was looking at him from afar in this video, that was pretty daring, you know, to kind of show this uh, flirting. And, but Egyptian cinema actually was was pretty daring at the time. In fact, I think it was much more daring than today. And uh, and so, so it was taken from a film with Abdel Halim Hafez, and I took the clip from that film. An Egyptian movie. I mean, like when? Oh, when? So we're talking here like uh, 60s, the 1960s. Because I was thinking about the way she was dressed. Oh, yeah. Very, like, elegant, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's amazing if you look at Egyptian films from the era, how sophisticated they were, not only in terms of fashion, but also like the, the cinematography, the editing, the dialogue. I mean, these were, you know, classics. So, uh, did, did you like Abdel Halim Hafez? He was known as Al Andalib Al Asmar, and he was kind of like a sex symbol. From Kurtzum, you know, I hate to call her a sex symbol, but when she sang, people fainted, so it's a good thing to do. But again, these, we were talking about, you know, musicians and singers who in the 60s and early 70s would record these one hour songs and 45 minute songs. and. You know, and then we had kind of a breakthrough, and there everybody should look at Professor Ava Hash <laughs> sitting there, because when I say this name, you may see a fainting. <laughs> Live, not rehearsed, Alexander, make sure if she falls, yeah, and that's that. So her name, are you ready? Fairuz. Uh, yeah, 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 there she's nodding. Okay, so Feru is known only by one name. The name means turquoise. Her real name is uh, Nohat Haddad. Kind of started a brand new genre on her, her own, along well with her husband, who was her composer, and his brother, called the Rahbani Brothers. And she did something pretty radical, this woman you're looking at on the screen. She made Arabic songs from 60 minutes, three minutes, yeah, or four minutes. And that was pretty radical. People were like, what? This is like almost Western for to have a quick, how much can you get in three minutes? You know, it's not a journey, it's a moment, you know. But she managed to survive the criticism, and thanks to her husband, her late husband, uh, Asi Rahmani, and his brother Mansoor, that she managed to have a career where it, she kept going on and on, and it's still going on. At 80 years old, she just performed in Beirut. Now, granted, she's not the Beirut that was, you know, a little more, you know, in her. She wasn't really known for her energy anyway. But, uh, <laughs> but like at the last concert, I remember she stood there, and everybody was, you know, she's 80 and she's still singing, and everybody has a memory associated with a Beirut song. And young or old, and at one point in the concert she's singing, and then she moved her hand. I think from here, no, I think I went too far, from here to here. And people cheered, like, oh, she moved. <laughs> but, you know, she's getting, she, she, she never was known for, like, dancing or whatever, but, you know, right. And, and that was the, what Ava said is true. She, she kind of, it was all about her voice and her delivery. Salam alaikum, Jai, come in and, and, and grab, grab food and grab a, uh, a list. Uh, anyway, so she, but but you know, it wasn't like about show, you know, it wasn't it wasn't a show so much on her. There were dancers and other ones, and one of the things Feidus did was she sang for marginalized groups. She's Lebanese and she's Christian, unlike the first two singers we we heard, and uh, she sang for Jerusalem. She sang for um, uh, love for and but mostly for Lebanon. 
she is known as, you know, the Lebanese singer, grand dame, diva of all time, and of course that of the whole Arab world. Here's a very old clip of a Louis singing for Jerusalem. She calls it the city of peace, and hopefully that's what we all, I think, want to see no matter where we are in terms of ethnicity or geographic location. This song kind of talks about Jerusalem being for the Jews, the Christians, and the Muslims all living in, together in peace. And it has subtitles. So that was in the, after the 1967 uh, war. Uh, we have another advertisement here, we'll mute it. And I can skip in two seconds, maybe Eric, I'm gonna need you after all to skip. Yeah, skip. Um, all right, Eric, Eric, maybe you can do that here with one of the skipping. Anyway, so. All right. So, uh, so Yusuf Fayou is very solemn, singing to for Jerusalem, a very old clip from the late sixties, and uh, that song sort of took the Arab world by storm, and also you know appealed to uh, I think more of an international audience as well. But Fayou's songs also were sometimes playful, sometimes. Uh, what's going on here? Is it? You play, play, play first. Oh, we have to watch the commercial. Play, play then skip. Now skip. Okay. Oh, cool. At least they could have put like an Arabic related commercial. Like almost. <laughs> anyway, so Beirut's style, I mean, you saw was very sort of somber there where she was singing for Jerusalem. But she would sing from the heart. This is probably her biggest hit ever. It's called Habaytak the Life. I loved you in the summer. And now I'm going to teach you a word in Arabic that uh, is going to make you blush. Do you know how to say winter in Arabic? In Lebanese Arabic? Yes, <laughs> Michael, you can say it. It's not a cuss word in Arabic. Yeah, shitty. So the word shitty, that all means winter, it does not mean what you think, especially while you're eating, I don't want to But so, so the song is Habaytak Besaif, Habaytak Beshitti. And when I, but it just means I loved you in the winter. And, uh, and of course, like she sings it with such passion that she always ends up with like shitty, and people go like, Americans go, oh my god. She's not feeling well, uh, but but uh, you know it's uh, it's a good way to re remember how to say winter in Arabic. Because how's the weather in winter? Yeah. All right. I tried. There's so much more to Arabic music. Does anybody have questions? Maybe I should go speak here. Does anybody have a swan? <laughs> yes, Mr. Offendum. Well, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm sorry I came in late. I was at another event earlier. I'm not sure if you uh, covered this or not. Uh, but I noticed that when you were showing the Olympic book, you were talking about how you know, provocative things you're getting. Yes. Um, there are a bunch of stuff about the uh, underheading, like French kissing girls. That oh, yeah, yeah. That's a really good point because what I said about Arabic video clips on, you know, there's about 200 uh, MTV type stations with 24 hour video clips in the Arab world through satellite. They don't show kissing in Arab video clips like kissing on the mouth. That does not apply to Egyptian films. Egyptian films you would see bed scenes and uh, back in the 50s it was wow. <laughs> so yes, that's a very good point almost. Somehow our parents generation have forgotten that. Yeah, and, and to this day they're saying like you know, well if if it's in a film it's okay to lock lips, but not in a video clip. I guess the video clip market is younger people. I don't know. It's very strange. Uh, like I said, one guy, one Lebanese guy named Jad Shwayedi, uh, kissed a girl on the lips, and that video was pulled off the air, and he was blacklisted. Yeah, can I also say hello to Dr. Alim? Hisham Alim, I've known for 10 years. I, I won't embarrass you, but you see how he has a beard now and he's a distinguished professor and young man? <laughs> I knew him before he could shave. <laughs> he was my student and he has gone on to do fantastic things. His book, Articulate While Black, about Obama, is like one of the best.
best reads you'll ever have. Brand new book. He's been to Egypt. He does. He specializes in hip hop, Islam, and hip hop. Uh, speaks perfect Spanish now, better than Arabic, I hear. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> yes, please. Oh, uh, going through all of these uh, little clips, I had this um, distinct sense that women's voices are getting higher with time, you know, that the style seems to have changed. And I was wondering if there's like a moment when that shift happened. Somebody like, do you mean the pitch in their voice or, yeah. or what they're saying? Yeah, the pitch in their voice. Well, you know? that's actually a good question because, you know, we're on Kulthum and, you know, the larynx of gold and Feiru is very restrained. Now we have, you know, girl, young women singing hip hop. And, and certainly borrowing from Western genres. And I'm, I'm a believer that you can empower women and marginalized social elements by borrowing good things from the West. I'm not into like, well, if it's Western, it's bad. On the other hand, I think Haifa Web is a good example of how so westernized can the Arab people become that now we're just objectifying women there the way we objectify them here and, you know, until maybe recently, arguably. So, uh, but in terms of their voices, absolutely, maybe it was unacceptable for a woman to be screeching, sort of letting it all out, you know? Mariam, that you saw with the hijab and non-hijab has a great voice. Yes, sir. So, I'm, I'm from Iran, and one of the transitions that's happened in Iran, I'm wondering whether that has happened anywhere in the Arab world, um, is that after the Islamic Revolution, essentially all Western instruments, you know, many of the earlier clips you showed had violins, like uh, cellos, and, and the orchestration is very much uh, a, a Western rendition of traditional Arabic uh, melodies. Mm -hmm. and, and that has been completely done away with in Iran. And I'm wondering whether such a transition has ever occurred in in any of the Arab countries, and I'm not really treating all of um, the Arabs as one nation, as, as distinct different right. cultures. Is there any part of the Arab world that, that has retained its authentic instruments in expressing its melodies and its music? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I want to say about the new, you know, revolutionary or post-revolution uh, music is that they do a good job of blending the oud, for example, which is a very an Eastern instrument, with the violins. And so it's you hear a west, or an Eastern beat, a very you know Oriental beat, uh, with Western uh, things. But I think that's why I love it because it hasn't just copied the West; it's borrowed some things and done it. But in response to your question, I think more progressive people in Egypt today are very worried about the fact that Mursi, the president of Egypt right now, is uh, putting, you know, the John Stewart version, which we saw the Basim Yusuf in jail for saying something against the president and for becoming too Western. Uh, now Masro Leila, I'm not sure if they're going to be able to ever go back to Egypt, at least not Hamid Sinno. So there is this kind of ab abolishing of, you know, what is now seen as Western constructs. And unfortunately, it's still seen like like um, gay people or, or the fact the, the concept of being gay is still seen as a Western construct. Although, of course, Arab history and literature is filled with examples, but they still say, oh, well, he went to the West, he studied there, so he picked it up there, came yeah. back and wants to practice it here. Uh, uh, so I think this kind of thing, I mean, it hasn't really happened in terms of the music. Maybe also the internet has a lot to do with it. Uh, the countries in the Gulf that normally ban this kind of uh, Ibahi video, uh, thanks to the internet, people can, can get on and, and watch Haifa Wahbe and others. Uh, I think there's a fear of that happening. But I, I, I don't see it as really because of the internet and independent artists like Omar Fendam doing their own stuff. I don't think Omar can go to Eve, to Syria right now, right, Omar? Yeah, he's been abolished in Syria despite being a Syrian-American uh, artist, singer, whose very album is called Syrian Americana, and who hopes for a better tomorrow for all Syrians that can't watch what's going on there without doing something about it. I'm speaking for you, Omar. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, Roy. Um, you showed artists from uh, Egypt, Lebanon, and from Syria, and I'm wondering what is the process that happened in other countries? Like, is a similar process happened in Saudi Arabia, 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I really wish we had like this would be like an all-day thing that we could have lunch <laughs> and then come back because I really did feel in the artists that I did, I mean, I felt short of so many. There are artists in the Gulf that are actually breaking ground now, especially women singers, uh, but not maybe as you know as radically as their female counterparts in you know Lebanon or Jordan or Tunisia. Uh, but, but having said that, like North Africa also has an amazing array of singers who are who sing, you know, the Rai and the Gnewa and all these, uh, you know, amazing, uh, you know, their African influenced rhythms too. And they're doing a great job of calling out for liberation as well. With one guy you saw with Khalid who sang with Noah that um, duet, uh, Imagine. He was from North Africa. Yes, uh, Maya, right? Yes. I thought you were Yes, Maya. Um, so I was wondering, as an Arab who is outside of the Arab world, do you think the Arab diaspora is affecting music now that there's increasing numbers of Arabs living outside of the Arab world? Yeah, I mean, is, is uh, Arab American music or Arab Canadian music evolving differently than the way Arabic music is evolving back in the you know native country? And the answer is yes, but then again, that goes back into the mutual influence. Mashlur Layla are clearly influenced by you know, Western traditions. There's bands that, that are doing Arabic rock. One of them is a Jordanian band called Jadal. It's totally rock and roll with Arabic lyrics, you know. Uh, but I think in Arab American audiences, and I shouldn't generalize at all here, tend to be maybe a little less shocked by the representation of women, free women, uh, uh, powerful women or, you know, LGBT people in video clips. Uh, but that's being sort of now exported back to the, you know, to the Arab world, to parts, parts of the Arab world. There's a lot going on in terms of civil rights in, like, Lebanon right now. Amazing stuff. Yes, Farah Wehbe, and then we'll go to Yaqub. Yes, Farah Wehbe. Her very name, Farah, means joy. So if you find yourself really happy as she's asking, it's totally normal. I'm more. I love it. a great question. I mean, you know, uh, Arabic literature, and speci specifically the Nobel uh, Prize winning Egyptian writer Najib Mahfouz, who won the Nobel Prize in 1988, has books where he has represented gay people. It's just, but I, they tend to be very tragic portrayals. They tend to end up either murdered for their act, or they end up being uh, very miserable and punished. But still, then the question is, is it better to represent uh, LGBT people in literature this way or not represent them at all where they don't exist? At least they exist, you know, and is it a step towards, you know, a, a better representation? I mean, America in the 50s and 60s represented homosexual characters in films like Suddenly Last Summer in a very, you know, uh, uh, demonic way. And it's not till you know the, the later years, later decades, that we now have you know more full, more fair portrayals. But uh, Najib Mahfouz got away with it, I think, because he was already a big name, and because he was seen as someone who dabbled in, in social issues that nobody wanted to talk about. But he didn't necessarily endorse it. Uh, Yusuf Idris, his counterpart, who, uh, in many people's uh, opinions, should have won the Nobel Prize instead of Najib. He actually did a short story in a magazine called October in Egypt, and it was a, uh, about a gay man living in the countryside who was like the mayor of a village who's, who was coming into terms with his sexuality. Uh, that representation seemed a lot more full and, color and fair and colorful than Najib Mahfouz. Uh, so, but literature, you know, is not like the only outlet now, so this is what the young people are watching, and so to, I guess I'm not going to speak for Morsi, but it's more dangerous to represent them on TV and in video, popular video clips than in a book.
Israeli Arab choir oh. collaborations, Arabic and Hebrew music together, and there there was a lot. So if I had brought Turkey into it, it would have been like a whole other aspect. But that would be something that to look into. Now, off the top of my head, I'm thinking of Ajda Pekan, who is a, uh, a Turkish female vocalist who that, who's doing a lot of work with Arab artists. She's like it's like the Feyruz of Turkey, you know. She's older. Um, and uh, there, there's a lot of Turkish influences. I know at KZSU we got a lot of uh, CDs released by Turkish artists, uh, and you can see Arab, Arab singers with them, musicians, uh, Israeli singers too. I mean, it's kind of like it's a, it's a really nice representation, and they do they produce some of the most amazing music. You speak Turkish, Jacob? No. <laughs> I'll give you ten minutes. This kid took my Arabic class and one of the brightest kids I've ever had the honor of teaching. Picks up Arabic like a sponge. And loves Beirut. <laughs> right? Uh, yes. Uh, so was there somebody? Uh, let me go to the young lady and then to Omar. Yes. Um, my question is about the use of instruments. I know that um, by region it varies. Like, in some places in the southland, other stuff. Um, but I was just wondering, it seems to me like across time, there's, there's always been like guitars and violins and other Western instruments. In the Arab world, are we seen as Western instruments, or have they been around for so long that they're just part of the, the Arabic um, instrument? Box? Yeah, I mean, there, there's a version of the violin called the Kamanja, you know, which is kind of the, like a violin or not, you, that still you, it prevails. But I think Feyruz was instrumental in that because before Feyruz, they were seen as Western instruments made for Western scales on the music scale. Uh, and so when you watch um, Kurtzum's band, you know, there was no electric guitar, there was a lot of wood. And, but violins were always sort of seen as, as on both sides. Uh, but, uh, but I think uh, now you're seeing a resurgence of the wood. Like the Oud is coming back in Mashru Alayla's songs. And the guy, if you saw him in the Mashru with the violin, was playing totally like Arab beats, uh, the, the scales, you know, the, the, the ones that have a lot of black keys and the other way. Well, I would say one last question because we're running a little bit over. Okay, so uh, I know Omar wants to ask a last question, and I'll, I, can, I can hang out there if you want to hit me or. <laughs> Or hug me. <laughs> yes. yes. I have a comment and a question. First, uh, for the gentleman who asked about like other countries, uh, some phenomenon that I've noticed recently in uh, Saudi Arabia is uh, the kind of YouTube comedians that have been coming up. Uh, they have really incredibly uh, bright and hilarious uh, young comics who are putting together uh, YouTube videos that have millions of hits and cult followings that are uh, basically just you know comedians who are kind of poking fun at different aspects. Some of them are even scripted, uh, and this is all kind of working within the confines of what's allowed in Saudi. So there are very few women in the, in the videos, but uh, they're, they're actually really groundbreaking in their own way. So and are they getting away with it, like, or are they being persecuted well, for? Um, no, they uh, they get away with it. First of all, it's very subversive. It's very kind of. Uh, it's not in your face critique. It's kind of you have to be of a certain kind of level uh, to even get it. Um, but then also, once they saw how quickly it was catching on, where they were getting millions of hits and they could monetize it, they started getting corporate sponsorships. Mm -hmm. And that's what ultimately matters in a place like Saudi Arabia, I think, more than anything else. Uh, so that that was kind of how they've been they've been getting their uh, you know. And there's been a whole space that's been created all of a sudden for stand up comedy in Saudi where it's nothing that exists. Yeah. Um, but I had a question for you, Ramsey. Uh, this is something that I know I do it. This is something I know I've seen happen a lot. When we look at like music from another culture, another place, we really try to find the parallels of it. So people always come up to me and say, oh, you like the Arab women. I get that. Me more. The Arab, whatever. You know? and I'm just wondering, when is, when is that? Can, can that be problematic, do you think, like creating more parallels between this I love that you're asking me that because I would be like right back at you. You're yeah. living proof 
of this kind of commentary. And of course, you know, pigeonholing somebody, we do, you know, relating them to someone we know. I don't think that's necessarily bad as a starting point, Omar, because uh, it, it, it takes a lot for people who have never been to the Arab world, who all watch you know, representations of Muslims and Arabs on TV as always being these demons and this and that, for them to take a step towards wanting to know, well, if it's closer to them to go through M&M to get to Omar and offend them, I would say better than not trying at all, you know. Uh, and the other thing is, I think in some of your lyrics, you also use English, you know, so you're, you're, uh, you appeal to uh, audiences back in, uh, at home, you know, in, in the Arab world and here as well. And I think that that makes you a very good bridge to uh, the new uh, music of the Arab Spring. I didn't ask this question to start getting No, but you really did. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> Julia, thank you so much for making this happen. You're amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And everybody here, thank you so much. Every Thursday, well, no, tune in, period. If you happen to tune in on Thursday between 3 and 5.